1999, a mysterious disappearance occurred in the United States that still haunts people's minds today. An 11-year-old girl was left alone for 90 seconds and literally vanished. Years later, police would find a bill with I am alive written on it in the girl's name. In this video, we've compiled all the information we have on what happened to Michaela Biggs. On January 2nd, 1999, in the American city of Mesa, Arizona, two sisters, 11-year-old Michaela and 9-year-old Kimber, were walking close to home. It was a chilly evening and was just beginning to get dark outside. Despite the height of winter, Arizona is a warm southern state. So Michaela brought her bike and rode alongside her sister. At one point, the girls thought they heard the sound of an approaching ice cream truck. They put speakers on them and turned on music to alert children to the approach of a favorite treat. The girl hurried home to ask her mother and change for ice cream, then returned to the street. However, the ice cream truck was nowhere to be found and the girls began to wait. At some point, Kimber got cold. She told her sister that she would run inside to get a jacket and come back. When she arrived back, Michaela was no longer there. The bike was lying on the road with its wheel still spinning. Beside it lay the two coins the girl had prepared to buy ice cream. Kimber came home and told her mother that Michaela was missing. Neither she nor her mother had yet allowed even the thought that anything could have happened to the girl. The mother thought that Michaela had gone to a neighbor with whom the family was friendly, but the girl was not there and the mother realized that something terrible might have happened to her daughter. Immediately thereafter, she went to the police. It is worth noting that the police response was very fast. Already, in 30 minutes, a helicopter was in the air. The law enforcers stopped all suspicious cars, bypassed the surrounding houses. That day, volunteers from the girls' school handed out and posted flyers with her picture. Those pictures would later appear in storefronts and on billboards along roads throughout Arizona. Police searched dumpsters and inspected hundreds of homes. Detective Butch Gates and Jerry Gissell were assigned to the case. The cops questioned every ice cream vendor in the state and could not establish that at least one of them was in that area at the time of the girl's disappearance. Detectives reconstructed the chronology of events and came to an eerie conclusion. The girl disappeared in just 90 seconds. That's how long Kimber had been missing. The spinning wheel on the bicycle confirmed the fact that the abduction had taken place extremely quickly. Search dogs, the help of which was used by the investigation, could not get a trace of the girl, and when they did, they took only a few steps in the direction of the road. The fact that the dog takes the mark of the person only when the missing person left on his feet, this only reinforced the main version of the police. The girl was put in a car, taken away, and it all happened in a matter of seconds. The situation was complicated by the complete lack of witnesses Despite the fact that the girls were playing in a street filled with houses, none of the neighbors saw them that night. Later, there was information that a man tried to kidnap the two girls right out of school. The children were 10 and 11 years old at the time. Police checked the information for a connection to the disappearance of Michaela, who was just 11, but the kidnapping turned out to be a failed prank. There was less and less evidence, so police began working out the standard theories. When a child goes missing, parents and other relatives are always checked. Given that Michaela's mother was at home at the time of the kidnapping, investigators took on the girl's father, Darian Biggs. From the beginning, no one really believed in his involvement. Why would a father kidnap his own daughter, especially in such a way, in the middle of the street, in a short period of time, when his other daughter was running home? However, it soon became clear that the man had lied about his alibi. During the first interrogation, he stated that he was at work at the time of the abduction, which turned out to be untrue. In reality, he was spending time with his mistress. What happened next was even more interesting. The man failed the polygraph questioning. His wife admitted that she knew about the cheating. Darian himself had told her about it a month before it happened. The couple thought about divorce. Despite the fake alibi, the police eventually stopped considering the father as a suspect. Even in the event of a divorce, his wife had no plans to forbid him from seeing his children. He simply had no motive. In addition, the detectives acknowledged that the lie detector results may have been influenced by the emotional state of the father 
whose daughter had just been abducted. He may even have laid some of the blame on himself and thought that if he had been home with his family, the tragedy could have been avoided. Detectives also tracked Darian's movements that evening and determined that he simply would not have had time to hide Michaela. The man showed up at home very quickly after his spouse called him to report his daughter missing. Detective Giselle later stated that Michaela most likely did not know her abductor. If it had been the father, she would not have thrown the bicycle and change on the ground. The girl tried to run away from the stranger, but simply did not make it. During the investigation, police regularly had leads that led nowhere. An anonymous man called detectives and reported that Michaela's body was in an abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. Police combed the area, but found nothing. Later, they received an email from an anonymous man claiming that he was the one who had kidnapped the girl. The FBI fairly quickly traced the sender's IP address and sent a SWAT team to his home in the city of Phoenix. It turned out that the sender was a 12-year-old boy who had just decided to make a joke. Meanwhile, the police had reached a stalemate, beginning to process even the most incomprehensible theories. They combed through 35 abandoned gold mines in the county and then even questioned nearly 500 psychics who could supposedly help the investigation. Of course, this went nowhere. One witness was found who had seen a mint-colored Jeep shortly before Michaela was kidnapped. The driver was quickly found and proved innocent. After that, the police were already desperate to find the girl because there was literally not a single clue left in front of them. This went on until September 27, 1999 when the quiet county was not shocked by another shocking event. A woman living near Biggs returned home and walked into the kitchen to find a middle-aged man with his pants unbuttoned. Without uttering a word, he jumped on the woman and began strangling and abusing her. The perpetrator then set fire to the house and left. Apparently, the attacker thought his victim was dead, but the woman survived. Her neck was broken, but she was able to reach the phone and call an ambulance. Already on her way to the hospital, she whispered to the doctors from her last breath, Michaela Biggs, the girl who is missing, he took her, you must save her. The whole town was on its ears again, events swirled rapidly. The police took up the case and arrested the assailant. He turned out to be D. Bullock. The man was a well-known alcoholic in the area who lived with his wife and three children, repaired wrecked cars and occasionally disrupted public order. His house was only two blocks from Biggs. D was one of the first to volunteer to help find Michaela and willingly let police into the house to search, but not into the trailer in the backyard. For the trailer, he demanded a warrant. Agree, this behavior is extremely bizarre. A man with a bad reputation, volunteering to help find a missing girl, giving the police a look around his house without any questions, and suddenly forbidding them to look in the trailer. From then on, Bullock became the prime suspect, even though his wife provided him with an alibi for the time Michaela was kidnapped. No one believed her story, and most likely, she was just afraid of her husband. Detectives began digging into Bullock's past and discovered that he had been tried three times for violence and molestation, as well as for kidnapping minors. He didn't get out of prison until 1995, and at that time, None of the neighbors had any idea what kind of monster lived next door. Several times a week, Michaela took private piano lessons from a neighbor who lived across the street from Bullock's house. This suggested that the man may have known the girl long before she disappeared. After Bullock was arrested for assaulting the woman, the police searched his house again and planned to investigate the trailer he had kept them out of earlier, but they were disappointed. The trailer had disappeared without a trace. This was a major blow to Michaela's parents. They were sure their daughter was there, alive or not, but he had disappeared and the police were unable to trace his location. Bullock was sentenced to 15 and a half years in prison for the September 27, 1999 attack on the woman. He categorically denied any involvement in Michaela's disappearance. This is not surprising, for the attack on his neighbor and the atrocities he did to her 15 years in prison would be a lenient sentence by U.S. standards. A confession to kidnapping an 11-year-old girl, on the other hand, could have landed him straight in the electric chair. The parents could not accept that their only hope for the truth was gone. 
The mother and father wrote Bullock a letter directly to the prison, asking the ultimate question, whether he had anything to do with Michaela's disappearance. No one hoped to get a confession, but the criminal's answer took the parents by surprise. He wrote that the conversation was too personal and suggested that her parents visit him in prison. At that moment, hope rekindled in the hearts of the parents that Bullock would confess, but they were greatly disappointed. Sitting across from the perpetrator, the father asked if he had anything to do with his daughter's disappearance. Bullock simply replied that he had nothing to do with her disappearance. The conversation continued in this vein for several more minutes, after which the perpetrator simply picked up and left, accompanied by security. It looked as if he was just teasing the parents, giving them false hope and destroying it by looking them in the eye. For a sadist like Bullock, the suffering of others can bring unsurpassed pleasure. This is apparently why he arranged the meeting with the grief-stricken parents. Afterwards, Michaela's father confessed that he was convinced that Bullock was involved. He stated, I was sitting a few feet away from the guy who killed my daughter and there was nothing I could do about it. At this point, even the most staunch hopes of solving the case were abandoned. Absolutely everyone believed that no new leads would ever emerge. Years later, they would realize that they were wrong, but more on that later. On the fifth anniversary of Michaela's disappearance, the parents buried an empty coffin, finally saying goodbye to their daughter. During this time, their marriage broke up. They changed the residence and were reluctant to contact journalists. Until 2018, the case went into a long drawer. The police simply had nothing to work with. But out of the blue, an event occurred that stirred up all of America. On March 14, 2018, a dollar bill was accidentally dropped at a police station in Nina, Wisconsin. On it was written in stubby handwriting, My name is Michaela Biggs, kidnapped from Mass. I am alive. The bill was found by a local resident who was collecting coins and dollar bills in a jar. He was the one who came across the dollar, after which he reported the find to the police and they instantly reopened the investigation. Michaela's mother rushed nearly 2,000 miles away to look at the handwriting and see if the message was actually written by her daughter. Other relatives also came to the station, but they all made a disappointing statement. The handwriting looked nothing like Michaela's and the name was misspelled. The mother suggested that the bill might be someone's extremely unfortunate prank. The other relatives also supported this theory. Despite this, the police attempted to trace the bill's path. Alas, it was almost impossible to do so. Paper money changes owners so many times that it was impossible to find the author of this inscription. Experts who studied the bill suggested that the inscription was made by an adult man who was trying to imitate the handwriting of a child. Despite all this, the message on the paper bill seems highly suspicious. Could it have been someone's prank? The chance of police and relatives finding out about the bill are extremely slim. It could have been passed around for years, or it could have settled in a bank vault and no one would have noticed it. The fact that it ended up in the hands of a concerned person who reported it to the police is more of a miracle than inevitability. As for the handwriting, the most obvious version cannot be ruled out. Mikhail may have written in a hurry for fear of being caught. Besides, she had been missing for nine years before the bill appeared. Assuming someone held her captive, did they give her something to write all that time? In nine years without practice, handwriting can change beyond recognition. There is another question no one knows the answer to. How long ago this writing was made? The bill could have been in circulation for years or it could have appeared shortly before it was discovered. It's worth remembering about Bullock who was supposed to be released from prison in 2017. Perhaps this evil prank is his doing Suffice it to recall how he tormented unhappy parents by giving them false hope. Perhaps we will never know the answer to all these questions again, or this case will once again shake the world with unexpected details. Kimber, who was the last person to see her older sister before she was kidnapped, still can't forget that gruesome January night. For a long time, she blamed herself for going home to get her jacket, but now she realizes against an adult kidnapper, she would have been helpless. Kimber raises her young son to whom she constantly talks about his Aunt Michaela. She calls her an angel who looks out for him. The girl, as well as the rest of her family, are sure that Michaela was kidnapped by Bullock, but without evidence, it can never be proved, unless the criminal himself decides to confess in order to deal another blow to the missing girl's family. 
Do you think there's any hope that the writing on the bill was done by Michaela herself and she is still alive? Write your thoughts in the comments below the video. Also, don't forget to like the video if you like it. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. Thank you for watching.